Hi, everybody. I'm Kevin Sabet. I'm the president and CEO of the Foundation for Drug Policy Solutions. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you virtually today. And I just want to thank Jason Renaud and the Mental Health Association of Portland, um, the Alternative Mobile Services Association, and really the Oregon Housing uh, Conference for having me. Uh, really, it's a very important conference, obviously, huge issue uh, with housing, especially in Oregon, making international headlines sometimes, uh, for better or worse. Uh, but we know that we have a lot of work to do. Um, I'm also, uh, you know, really honored to speak about the addiction issue and the drug issue more generally. I really try and take a bipartisan approach to this issue, really a nonpartisan approach. Um, I served in three different White House administrations, Republican and Democrat. And, uh, you know, I've learned that these are not issues that are really should lie on party lines. They're, they're human issues. They're issues that affect people and their families. Um, this is people's lives on the line. And it's really not, I don't think, time for um, sort of pettiness uh, and um, really frivolousness. It's time to think big. Uh, and especially on the issue that I would ask to talk about, which is really more about um, the impact of Measure 110 in Oregon and also just addiction generally, I want to touch on as well. Uh, you know, I'm going to show some slides, but I, I do want to just chat a bit with you first. Uh, you know, addiction is one of these interesting issues. Uh, we've heard of it being described as a disease, which I think in many ways it is. Uh, but as, you know, Herb Kleber famously said, you know, addiction is not a disease of the elbow. Uh, so it's not like other kinds of diseases that affect our physical body, that it's a disease of the brain, which is a little bit different. Um, we we have other diseases of the brain that we obviously deal with, um, you know, different mental illnesses, uh, dementia, Alzheimer's. Uh, and, you know, those are diseases that uh, are just because they don't affect the physical, what we might think is the rest of the body. Uh, they are, you know, extremely, uh, they, they affect people and their families in a, in a really dangerous way and really impactful way, usually for the, for the you know, worse. And, um, you know, Congress and uh, the insurance industry has a hard time understanding that the brain is part of the body and that these diseases should be treated like we would treat heart disease or a physical disease. But also there's a I think there is a key difference with addiction, which is really interesting, which is really a lot having to do with the environment and a lot having to do with consequences, carrots and sticks and incentives um, in a way that, you know, a disease like dementia, you know, it'd be very hard to tell somebody with dementia uh, you know, that if they remember your name tomorrow, for example, um, you know, you're going to give them a million dollars and then they'll change. Uh, they, they they won't. Uh, right. Uh, but we have seen with addiction that actually incentives or consequences and obviously ones that are um, that are proportional, not outlandish, can have real effects on behavior. So that that's what makes, I think, addiction as a disease, a little bit of a different disease. Uh, and we look at what's happening with Oregon. Clearly, the addiction issue is front and center with the issue of housing and unhoused people, homelessness, mental illness. And I think sometimes, um, you know, we try and look for other issues. But I, from what I've seen, from what the data that I've seen uh, shows me, and just from my own eyes, walking around, you know, different cities in, in your state, this is what is very plainly seen. Uh, and so I think it's worth a bit of a deep dive in addiction itself. And then, of course, uh, in this really grand experiment, which it was, um, of Measure uh, 110. So when we think about, you know, substance use and addiction, and we think about, um, you know, the impacts that it has on society, we, it's fascinating to realize that, though, this is really a leading cause of preventable death. This is something that um, is our most, is our largest and most preventable and most costly public health and medical problem that it's related to at least six dozen uh, or five to six dozen other conditions requiring medical care and that it's directly impacting. And this is, you know, it, it does so, I think, in a way that is not uh, that we don't see as much with maybe other brain diseases. You know, Alzheimer's, as devastating as it is, you know, is not driving consequences like uh, crime now it does drive other consequences like neglect or let's say lost productivity, of course, or or family issues, no doubt. But when you look at addiction and the brain disease of addiction, you see that the consequences that it touches on, the impacts that it has all across society, I, I think are really, really profound. And that's why sort of, you know, we care about this issue so much and it's where we are. 
And when you look at, you know, the drug problems that we have, both in Oregon and really, you know, representing the country uh, more generally, obviously there's no easy answers. And this is where, you know, you'll see that I'm very, very skeptical about Measure 110. Uh, I'm skeptical about some of the intentions behind it. Not everybody's intentions, because I think some people's intentions were rightfully placed uh, in that we needed to find a new way that, you know, Oregon being 50th in the country notoriously for treatment delivery and one of the highest uh, rates of overdose death in the country. Um, you know, it's it's natural to say that we need to look for, uh, you know, n- new answers. So I, I don't blame anybody for doing that. That's a very good thing. Um, but it's clear that the solution for such a complex issue like this uh, is not going to lie in, um, you know, something that maybe sticks on a bumper sticker. And I was told once at the White House, I won't tell you which administration, that, you know, if it doesn't stick on a bumper sticker, it doesn't fit, I should say, on a bumper sticker, then it's not worth talking about. And, you know, I can understand that politically that that's the case. But, um, you know, when you look at, you know, complex issues like this one, uh, it's clear that the answer is not going to stick on a bumper sticker. Uh, It varies dramatically by the kind of drug we're looking at, by the policy objective that you have, you know, is your policy objective to get people into treatment, to get them off of drugs, which I think was a stated policy objective of Measure 110, uh, or is it something else? Is it to simply prevent, um, let's say, hep C uh, transmission, in which case you don't really care if people are using drugs as long as they're not doing it in a way that's going to transmit hep C. Um, from what I've learned, I've seen that it's not usually something solved by the free market. In other words, if we just kind of leave this to the market uh, and take government out of the equation entirely, it usually spells disaster. Uh, a great example, of course, is what we did for 100 years and the most preventable death that we've ever witnessed on mankind, which is the deaths related to cigarettes, mainly lung cancers and other cancers uh, and, and things like COPD and stuff. And so when you look at something like cigarettes, which is a direct cause of still almost half a million deaths a year in the U.S. alone, uh, we left that to the free market for a very long time, right? We let cigarette companies, you know, run their playbook of marketing, commercializing, paying for their own studies, paying off every lobbyist imaginable and every politician imaginable on the state and federal level, glamorizing, getting celebrities to promote their products, downplaying the risks, and even promoting their product as healthy, which, you know, unfortunately, I see the same thing happening. I'm seeing it happening. We're all seeing it happening with uh, marijuana just right before our eyes. That's exactly the same playbook. But we're also seeing it happening with psychedelics and other drugs that are really now being touted as, um, you know, the drugs that um, are going to somehow you know, solve all of our problems at once, right? They're going to they're gonna cure PTSD, fill budget holes, increase research, and do all these wonderful things that were promised. Um, but I think we have cause for skepticism, given our history with cigarettes, our history with alcohol, our history with pharmaceuticals. Uh, look at the, uh, the painkiller crisis, right? The pain crisis that we've had, and the fact that we um, these are really killers. I mean, we've had you know the, the the overdose opioid overdose problem, which has precipitated the problem we have today with opioids and other drugs, other kinds of drugs. And uh, you know that started with the free market with uh, you know pharmaceuticals and having um, you know prescription drugs being basically given out like candy because uh, doctors and the pharmaceutical companies were in charge of everything. So um, I've also learned this is not only a public safety problem or a public health problem. That actually it's a much more complex issue. It's 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 both in so many ways. Again, um, you, we don't usually hear about crimes related to people stealing to, you know, fulfill their diabetic habit of Snickers bars or something like that, uh, or stealing from their own children or their own grandparents, you know, uh, to buy a Big Mac because they have hypertension or something. We don't, that is not what we see with other diseases. But addiction is the kind of disease that, it's not only public health, but it's public safety. It's both. It's not. It's not only public safety, right? We can't just throw people in prison and lock away, lock them away, and hope that that will just deter, you know, other people from using, and it will end the issue. It won't end the issue, right? It, it really needs to be uh, a multi pronged approach. And really, if you look at the landscape of drug policy out there, and I've been really involved in this issue more than twenty five years, there are really few 
organizations um, that are dedicated to this issue, really from a nonpartisan and way. You have a lot of groups that have agendas and they are pushing a very specific agenda or a very specific ideology or belief. Uh, and of course, you have some advocates that are trying their best. Um, but you very few sort of, I think, policy based organizations that are really thinking about this issue in a nuanced, uh, sorry, in a nuanced way. And that's actually what we are trying to do, you know, with the foundation for drug policy solutions, we're really trying to push this in a much more nuanced way, um, you know, but also in a way that makes sense to the average person. So, you know, when you look around in 2023, Obviously, Oregon made headlines becoming the first state to decriminalize the personal possession of all drugs. Uh, they also, by the way, on that same year, legalized psilocybin for medical use, uh, which it, I, you know is a whole other issue we're not going to talk about. But I don't think it's something we can completely ignore either. I think it's another example of the of the market, uh, you know, really taking over here and really putting their own profits ahead of public health. Um, you know, there, there's been a push in different places to legalize very controversial policies like injection sites without sort of proper oversight or neighborhood considerations. So, for example, if you think about Harlem, New York, and you think about the concentration of both methadone clinics and, uh, you know, overdose, what they would call overdose prevention, but I call just, you know, the, the name of it injection sites. Because I think when you say overdose prevention sites, you are implying a value that it already has rather than just describing what it is. So that's, that's another um, important point in drug policy that I think we should just describe things for what they are. Um, and, uh, you know, w without really a lot of oversight. And again, I mentioned the psychedelics part, which of course is linked to psilocybin. You know, one point on decriminalize is, of course, it is important to understand the nuance here. And what Oregon did, they were very clear when they said what they were doing. When I say they, I mean the proponents pushing this and other supporters, that they're not, they weren't going to legalize of drugs like fentanyl. In other words, they weren't going to legalize the sales of those drugs. So they wouldn't not, it's not like cannabis where there's just marijuana that's sold at stores and you get tax revenue. It's something that, you know, if you happen to get these drugs somehow, which, you know, it's sort of up to you how you get them. And it's kind of wink, wink, nod, nod on that side. Um, but, you know, if you do, if you are able to get those drugs, we're not going to criminalize you. And we're going to, what was promised, we're going to put you into treatment. And that was the grand promise. That's why I think you know, Measure 110 passed the way it did. Um, I'm going to come back to these slides uh, in, in, in a minute. But actually, I, I will just say again, unlike places that actually are giving out drugs entirely. I mean, this is a scene from Vancouver, British Columbia, uh, not far from where I am, where they're giving out heroin and cocaine and methamphetamine. Um, by the way, they have a overdose problem that's 50% higher than, than the United States. It's higher than Oregon's too, when you look at British Columbia. Um, but also Portugal, they decriminalized, they did not legalize. I'm going to come back a little bit later to the considerations of Portugal, because I think it's really important to make the nuance that understand the differences between Portugal and Oregon. But it is important on the sort of higher level to say that, you know, they did not legalize drugs. They did keep the supply of, of drugs illegal. And then they diverted users to what I would what was called dissuasion commissions. In other words, panels of social workers, doctors, etc., to try and get people to stop using. I think that's a key difference versus Oregon, which I will describe in a minute. Um, and of course, with anything in another place, another country, we really have to consider culture. So that's something that I don't think has been really considered as much. But I'm, like I said, I am going to come back to Portugal. I'm also wanting to kind of, I guess, put the good news out first, in a sense, which is, um, you know, we have things that do work, uh, by the way. We have things like drug courts, which are, you know, specialized courts, mental health courts that bring together, you know, doctors with the attorneys, with the defense attorneys, with the prosecutors, with social workers, with psychi psychiatrists and therapists that actually work on this on the individual in a holistic way, but also in the case of drug courts, offer carrots and sticks. And again, Measure 110, which I will talk a little bit more in detail about, did not does not really do that. It's not really about carrots and sticks at all. Um, but we have seen drug courts being very successful in reducing recidivism and, um, you know, all kinds of costs, saving jail space. Hawaii Hope, which began about amazingly almost 20 years ago, which is really about frequent testing and light sanctions. But again, having people that are using understand the fairness of the system and buying in themselves. 
uh, and uh, and of course offering treatment if needed too. So that's really interesting. Uh, but you know, just I'm going to stop my slides for a minute and describe a little bit more about Oregon. Of course, you know what Measure 110 was intending to do was really to say, you know, nothing is working. We're seeing this huge increase in overdoses, which again is very understandable. Uh, and so what we want to try and do is, you know, basically give people a ticket. Um, so that they can then either pay a $100 fine, which is obviously very low for most people, not for everybody. And so that was thought maybe that would be a deterrent for some people, but generally a very low fine. But it, you can get that fine waived by calling a phone number to try and get help, which again, sounds in theory like maybe that's a great idea. Let's give people the option. Let's not put them into jail. Let's not do anything mandatory. Let's give them an option of actually get going and getting um, getting some help. And uh, of course, the reality was is uh, you know we're we haven't really been seeing that. We haven't seen, first of all, many citations issued at all, mainly because people are not calling the phone number to get help. And that goes back to what I said originally, which was that you know addiction. It's related to what I said, which is that addiction does respond to some consequences sometimes. And when there's zero consequences to anything, um, it's hard to think that you're going to be changing behavior. Uh, so now that that was passed three years ago, I do think it's important, and I'll, I'll go back to my slides, to really understand, okay, well, what actually, you know, has happened, uh, you know, since then. And when you look, first of all, the, we, it's important to remember that possession charges for drugs were steadily declining before Measure 110. So this wasn't like, you know, this was happening just because of Measure 110. Already, there was a reduction because a lot of people in law enforcement thought, you know, we don't really need to be arresting people. We're not going to charge them with possession. If anything, we're going to try and get the dealers, the mid-level people, the higher level people. And so we're not going to waste a lot of time on possession. And also, these were often pled down. So you got, they didn't ever get the charge or they went to drug court, et cetera, and it was expunged or whatnot. So we did actually see before Measure 110, which passed in 2020, a, a reduction. Unfortunately, after 110, we're not really seeing the treatment uptake that I think a lot of people thought. And, you know, some people say, well, Kevin, you have to give it time. There's new ad newer data. When you look at the raw numbers, not just the percentages, uh, we're actually not seeing huge uptakes in treatment in any way that's going to touch the problem in Oregon. Um, just now, uh, it was just released to press. There's an article that says uh, that. Um, uh, and this is as of September 27th, that, you know, maybe there wasn't an inc increase in overdose. But a week ago, there was an article saying there was a 23 percent increase in in overdose in Oregon. Um, so there is some mixed data on it. But at the end of the day, whether there's a 23 percent increase or no increase or no decrease, we were supposed to see a large decrease by now, uh, three years later. And in reality, we're just not seeing this. We're literally seeing like the number of people you can like count on one or two hands in some counties that are getting treatment at all. We, we really can't, if that's the case, imagine that that's going to really change the trajectory of the issue. And so what the Lund report, which I, um, which is a great source of news in Oregon and that many of you know about, showed is that, you know, it was actually, that says greater, but it's less than 1% of those uh, helped with Measure 110 dollars actually ever enter treatment, that most of it was utilizing harm reduction services, which again is fine if that's what your intention was. But I think voters were told, no, actually, this is going to go to treatment. Um, we, we really haven't seen that at all. Um, we've seen a couple dozen juveniles with class E felonies, uh, in the last two years and about 129 people, um, you know, that adults that had these felonies, but, you know, again, these numbers are so small. And so Oregon is still ranked last in the nation for treatment, as I had mentioned earlier. Um, there was an analysis of, uh, the treatment system, um, uh, for Senate bill 1041, which basically kept saying that, you know, it's just Oregon is one of the top states in the country with drug use and one of the last country states in the country with treatment. Um, lots of gaps in treatment ability. Uh, you know, when you need more than two dozen facilities in your state to even come close. And remember, this is among like the denominator here is among people who would who would enter treatment. So we're looking at the gap given of the people who need treatment. But that is assuming those people are going to go to treatment. And I think that's a big question is how do we get people to go to treatment when they have compulsive behavior brought on by the disease of addiction? It's very difficult to do. And measure 110 
is the opposite of incentivizing anyone to try and get help and to try and enter treatment. And again, what we've learned, I think, is that we need to try to get people to change their minds. So it's not just wait lists, but it's also waiting for people to get help and want to get help. That's 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 the difference there that we really have to look at. Uh, so again, yes, huge gap, but also, um, you know, not, it's also a behavioral issue where we need to figure out ways to incentivize people uh, to, to get help. Uh, we've seen a steady increase in overdoses. And again, what's interesting with that paper that came out again today saying there was no increase, I think it did some, uh, a little bit of um, statistical gymnastics to get there, but it's really an outlier to the, uh, the, 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 the study that came out a couple of weeks ago showing the 23% increase. When you just look at the raw numbers and you look at, you know, CDC wonder database, you're seeing an increase in overdoses. That's just, that's just the bottom line. Um, by the way, the, the study that was done that showed the 23% increase was against a synthetic control, meaning it control, it set up a control. So it, it, it was, you know, versus something else, not just looking at the, the raw number. Um, you know, Measure 110 funds are also used, I think, uh, in many, many ways, which you can, you know, again, I, I've heard of there have been some positive parts of this. Um, my friend Mike Marshall talks about how a recovery system is being built since Measure 110, which never occurred in Oregon before. I think that's great. I think that's a, an example of one part of this that might be good that we need to keep. But when you look at the other parts I'm not seeing a lot. I'm not seeing a lot with housing in terms of like actual finding housing for people in a long standing way that's affecting the homelessness issue and the unhoused issue. I'm not seeing a lot for treatment or screening that's actually leading to anything. Um, and so I worry that, you know, state actors, of course, are incentivized to say that things are working really well and kind of grasping at straws in many, many ways um, in terms of some of the outcomes here. Uh, so, you know, again, we see housing being used for Measure 110 funds, but I guess I'd point it to you all as experts and to see is that really long lasting in terms of what's happening. Peer support is defined as the second biggest category in a very broad way. Again, what's the follow up to the peer support? I don't know. Um, uh, this is in Q2. Substance abuse treatment what is actually, what's the success rate? You know, what's happening? What's the entrance rate? Um, these are questions that I think really need to be, need to be asked. Back to Portugal, you know, we've heard so much about how Oregon is following Portugal's successful model. And again, I think the issue is, um, you know, Portugal did take a very big step, you know, over 22 years ago, but they were, they are the first pe people to tell you, and this is the Portuguese drugs are talking, that number one, um, they have not legalized or even decriminalized in the U.S. sense. What they've done is set up a separate system whereby drug users are cited. And they have to attend this dissuasion commission. If they don't, they're arrested. So that's a huge difference with Oregon. There's no follow up in Oregon. And uh, and and so they, if they do, they're arrested. And um, it meaning if they skip out and it, when they do come, if and when they do come, um, they are dissuaded from using whether it's referrals to treatment or fines or whatever it is. And uh, open air drug markets are completely illegal. So very, very different than Oregon um, when you see the open air drug markets going on. Now, of course, Portugal also hasn't been an unmitigated success, and they'll be the first ones to admit it. They've seen increases in use rates. Um, they've seen big rates <clears throat> in terms of 12-year highs in cocaine and ketamine use, um, must, among the highest in Europe. And actually, drug-related um, debris is up. These are studies found, um, and overall crime is up. So again, is it all because of this? You know, also, that's hard to you know connect everything to one policy. The other thing they did that was really invest in their treatment system in a big, big way. Although lately the investment apparently is less, but in the beginning they really invested in it, and I think that's why they saw some of the early success that they saw. Um, obviously, again, Oregon, very, very different in terms of what it did. And we actually have a one pager on our website that talks about some of the differences. So when you look at Portugal versus Oregon, like access to treatment, um, you know, no guaranteed care really in Oregon. Uh, some of the nonprofits are not treatment providers at all. There's a lot of red tape in Oregon, in Portugal, you have universal health care. Um, the state pays 80% at least even for private facility treatment. Um, there are mandatory assessments in Portugal. Drugs are confiscated. That's not the case in Oregon. 
Um, there's follow-up with assessment completed through a panel that's not done at all. The follow-up is totally up to the individual, which again, when we talk about the disease of addiction, leaving it all up to the individual is asking a lot for a disease that robs you of your, uh, um, often robs you of your rational, you know, decision-making ability. So the idea that we're going to kind of leave it up to people to decide for themselves, that's not very Portuguese. It's very, but it is very Oregonian. Uh, penalties for non-compliance. Um, there are penalties um, for those and pressure, none in Oregon. Public use in Oregon is totally tolerated. It's not in Portugal. Um, overdose rates compared to neighbors, depending on the year, Portugal's lower. Sometimes it's like the same, but generally lower. Oregon significantly higher. When you look at the differences between the United States as a whole, the differences between uh, you know other states around the country, obviously Oregon we're seeing is really a, an outlier in many ways. It's higher, and the, the continued use trend is increasing. So, you know, I think it is really important that. We are very careful when we do these comparisons, which we hear about a lot. I also think it's important that, you know, we're not necessarily rushing to judgment right now. There's still some more time, but I would say the early indications for Measure 110 are really poor. Um, it's not living up to, you know, what was really promised uh, by, um, you know, by by the, the advocates. And I think when you, you sort of look back at the advocacy groups and the folks that push this, and many of them have become very defensive when you just question sort of what's going on, you know, three years later, uh, you can see that there are oftentimes other motives, right? There are oftentimes motives that relate to the legalization of all drugs uh, and really relate to some things that are not probably out of the mainstream uh, in, in Oregon. So, um Again, is it early? Relatively, yes. Uh, so far, so good. I would say no. Uh, so far, not so good. And room for improvement, big time. And I think we need to work together to really identify those gaps. And that's why we launched, uh, I'll just do a little plug, we launched um, the Foundation for Drug Policy Solutions uh, to really be a resource to think about <clears throat> drug policy in a more uh, comprehensive way. Uh, to think to promote big solutions. So actually, front pages are Oregon and Portugal uh, one pager, which you can click on. Uh, we're really trying to promote a culture of prevention and a climate of recovery, using with law enforcement, with treatment, with prevention, uh, with people from multiple different you know administrations. We're really trying to lead that effort to scale up big, big ideas and really promote what works. That's really what we're about. Um, Evidence-based prevention, treatment and recovery for all, international cooperation, and smart law enforcement. So I would invite you all to go to gooddrugpolicy.org. Please get involved. If you have other questions, please let us know. Um, I'm currently working on a book uh, where I'm digging deep into Oregon as well as Washington State and British Columbia and some other places as well. Uh, and I think this is something that, um, you know, is going to have continued interest. It's something that we need to watch. And I'm very grateful for the Oregon Housing Conference to be covering this issue at all. Um, and of course, especially grateful that they asked me to talk a little bit about Measure 110 and about what Oregon is going through right now. So um, again, we're still gathering the facts. We're still learning. It's premature to say one thing, you know, over the other, but the way that the system is set up for the disease of addiction, which really the disease of addiction is about denial. Uh, that is the hallmark of addiction. That's the hallmark. It's denial, denying that there's a problem, denying that, you know, your family often denying there's a problem, um, society <clears throat> denying that there's an issue, wanting to kind of push it to the shadows. Um, and I worry that there may be systems set up within Measure 110 that continue some of that denial, that don't really kind of bring people to account in a compassionate way. Um, and I'm hoping, you know, anything done to revise what happened and what, what's happened can be done with that in mind. So <clears throat> thank you again for having me. It's been a pleasure and uh, good luck with the rest of the conference. Thank you.